wasn't a murder weapon. There weren't any witnesses. His bitter wife. It was sort of the perfect uh, revenge mode. Her lowlife boyfriend. Get out of here. Like a James M. Cain novel. The postman always rings twice. A lethal love triangle in the playground of the rich and famous. Tonight on Power, Privilege, and Justice. <laughs> of towns on the east end of Long Island where the super rich come to get away from real life. The most violent crime that I'm aware of in the Hamptons is a lady beat a parking enforcement officer over the head with a baguette for giving her car a ticket. On October 20th, 2001, East Hampton had its first homicide in 20 years. The crime scene this six-bedroom mansion on Middle Lane, an exclusive street one block from the ocean. Just a pitching wedge from the Seinfelds and the Spielbergs. It was a murder of the worst sort. It was violent, it was messy. I don't think anybody in the Hamptons would have expected this kind of homicide. The victim was Ted Ammon. The 52-year-old was a big fish even by East Hampton standards. A handsome, athletic financier worth upwards of $80 million. One of Wall Street's brightest stars snuffed out, just like that. The shock rippled through East Hampton. Everyone clamored to know what happened on Middle Lane that October night. He was bludgeoned to death. He was beaten. He suffered conservatively. The medical examiner estimated 30 to 35 blows to the head with a, a heavy blunt object. There were few clues. No sign of a break-in. No indication of a robbery. No clear motive. At this point in time, any, everything's a motive. Uh, and his uh, stature, his financial status are certainly things to be taken into consideration. But suspicion quickly swirled around two people. Ted Ammon's estranged wife, Generosa and her 38-year-old live-in boyfriend, Danny Pelosi, an unlicensed electrician with a history of drug and alcohol problems. A lot of people who knew the Ammons reacted by saying, so she did it at last. Oh, can you just address the allegations? For the New York media, the scent of sex, blood, and betrayal was too tantalizing to pass up. We have nothing to say today. We have nothing to say today. The story would dominate local news for the next three years. Ted Ammon was a larger-than-life character, incredibly brilliant, very rich. But no matter how high he soared, he never forgot his humble roots. Ted grew up in a middle-class family outside of Buffalo, New York. He went to Bucknell University, where he majored in economics and played lacrosse. He seemed like a typical frat boy, with one exception. He was brilliant. Ted Ammon was sort of a small-town kid who made very, very good. Very smart guy who then ends up in the early 80s working for Kohlberg, Kravis, Roberts, doing leverage buyouts. Ted quickly became one of KKR's top guns. He made partner while still in his 30s. Money was pouring in by the millions. He was, by all accounts, incredibly sharp, very driven, extremely ambitious, but a very nice and personable guy. Ted's first marriage ended in divorce in 1983. Looking for a new apartment to rent, he made an appointment with a real estate agent named Generosa Rand, but never showed up. This was something he was prone to do. He was. Uh, a little spacey for all his intelligence, um, flaky as one friend put it. Ted's friends might have forgiven him. Generosa did not. 
She got very angry about this and, you know, called him up and confronted him about this. And uh, there was something about this that he actually found sort of impressive, like the moxie of this woman. They dated for three years and wed in 1986. By all accounts, the marriage began well. It was a pretty good one, apparently, at the start. Uh, there was a lot of passion. At KKR, Ted had a role in the largest leveraged buyout of the decade, the $26 billion takeover of RJR Nabisco, a deal chronicled in the book Barbarians at the Gate. Then, in 1992, he struck out on his own. He was an entrepreneur. He started companies on his own. And he just built his wealth piece by piece. The Ammons bought luxury homes around the world. The mansion on Middle Lane, a luxury townhouse on Manhattan's Upper East Side, and a sprawling $6 million manor home in Surrey, England, called Coverwood. By one count, it had 50 rooms. By another count, it had 65 rooms. Apparently, it took uh, $100,000 just to maintain the thing every year. But Ted Ammon also liked to give back. He served on the board of jazz at Lincoln Center and donated $15 million to his alma mater. He even put his chauffeur's son through college. Mr. Ted Ammon, I'm very sure for me, he's an excellent person. Generosa embraced the lavish lifestyle. She had come from such a different world. The only thing she knew about her father was his first name, Generoso. The story goes that uh, Generoso's mother went to Italy, had a fling with this Italian sailor, uh, came back, conceived a child from it, and called her Generosa. When Generoso was 10, her mother died of cancer. After that, she bounced around living with different families. Now that she was married, Generosa decided to save two children from her own fate. She and Ted adopted twins, a boy and a girl, Alexa and Gregory, from an orphanage in Ukraine. Wonderful kids. Alexa and Gregor is so beautiful, beautiful two children. Family life was good, but after a few years, something began to change in Generosa. She started to act erratically, dropping friends for no reason, flying into sudden rages over the slightest things. One contractor told me about uh, planting 600 tulips for her in uh, their East Hampton house um, in a shade agreed upon by her. And the next weekend, she was ripping them all out in a fury, saying that it wasn't quite the right shade. Much of the rage was directed at her husband. A couple of times, when he's coming in, she received him big angry, big fire. The volatility that had once attracted Ted to Generosa now drove him away. By 1999, she was living with the children in England. He was living alone in New York. Convinced Ted was having an affair, Generosa hired a private detective. She was right. Her suspicions were confirmed. And that began the deterioration of the, of the marriage and the suspicion that really took hold inside of her, that her husband was hiding things from her, hiding money. Generosa returned to New York and filed for divorce. It was ugly from the start. She thought that Ted might be worth as much as $300 million. It took a long time for lawyers to uh, hammer out an understanding that Ted was, in fact, worth something more like between 50 and 80 million and that she would get some portion of that. While the lawyers battled over Ted's net worth, Generosa took aim at his cash flow. She and the children moved into a suite at the Stanhope, a swanky Fifth Avenue hotel, and began an expensive renovation on a $9 million townhouse. It required gutting, complete renovation. She took out a $3 million loan, started pouring money into it, started having everything redone. Meanwhile, in center Mauritius, Long Island, Danny Pelosi heard from a friend about a wealthy woman spending millions redoing her townhouse. Pelosi was an unlicensed and unemployed electrician with a wife and three children to support. He got in his truck and drove straight to the townhouse, hoping to find a job. 
He barely had enough money to fill his truck with gas to get into Manhattan from Santa Mauritius. His life was falling apart. His marriage was in disarray. He was unemployed and, and desperate. But Danny's luck was about to change. When Generosa laid eyes on the tall, lanky electrician, she could feel the voltage. She hired him on the spot. Before long, Danny Pelosi would work his way into Generosa's pocketbook and her bedroom. After Ted Hammond's body was discovered in his East Hampton mansion, homicide investigators became tight-lipped. Definitely. There'd be no updates. Uh, I've told you everything that I can tell you up to this point. But that didn't stop the media buzz. This was a big story in the Hamptons. Um, you know, in the days after the murder, um, there are people milling around, you know, either end of Middle Lane, quite unprecedented. Murdered millionaires always make headlines. But this one had an estranged wife in love with a penniless electrician, and the plot was thickening. Reporters dubbed Generosa and Danny the princess and the pauper. But what happened after these two hooked up was no fairy tale. What attracted the society lady to the low-life tough was a mystery played out in the tabloids. He's handsome. I'm sure he was quite charming. You hear that from people who know him in his personal life. Perhaps Generosa saw a bit of herself in the rough-and-tumble Marlboro smoking electrician. She was a working-class girl. She came from that kind of family. Pelosi certainly had that kind of background himself. He was also the antithesis of the man who had just broken her heart. She thought he was a regular blue-collar kind of guy who had family values. Uh, and he was, I guess in her mind, the opposite of her husband who had cheated on her. Whatever it was, it took hold fast. Before long, Danny was running the entire townhouse renovation project by day and sleeping in the boss's first-class hotel room by night. It was sort of the perfect uh, revenge mode for Generosa because uh, she was uh, spending all her husband's money, uh, having the renovation get more and more elaborate, and the money was going to her boyfriend. What could be better if you wanted to really stick it to your ex-husband? Indeed, Ted was troubled by the affair and worried how it would affect his children. He'd already had a couple DWIs at that point. Um, you know, he had a very uh, dubious uh, history uh, in other regards. I mean, he wasn't someone you necessarily wanted uh, shepherding your young children around. For Danny, the affair provided entree into a world he'd only glimpsed from afar. Before long, he was handing out $100 tips at the Stanhope, running up $1,000 bar tabs with his buddies, living life like a millionaire. I got lucky. I met a woman with money, <laughs> and I met a woman that loves me. Danny had a habit of often speaking about this hookup with Generosa Ammon as if it were with win akin to winning the lottery. He would always talk about it in almost mistressy terms. It was like he was the gigolo. By the summer of 2001, Danny seemed to have taken over Ted Ammon's life completely. He lived at the East Hampton mansion with Generosa. He drove Ted's cars around town, at one point getting arrested for another DWI. He even started dressing like Ted. Danny body snatched Ted Ammon's life. It's just amazing the sort of speed and alacrity with which he just kind of souped in there. By October 2001, Ted and Generosa's lawyers finally hammered out a settlement. They agreed that Ted was worth $46 million after debts and taxes, and Generosa would get half of it. They would also split custody of the children. All it required were signatures of husband and wife, and that was it. They were going to be done. They were going to begin their separate lives. With the divorce nearly final, Ted seemed reinvigorated. He had a new girlfriend and was ready to begin the next chapter of his life. 
he felt actually optimistic, you know. He was, he was through that worst part. He was a very fit, vigorous guy, age 52, very youthful looking. In a sense, he still had his whole life, or most of it, ahead of him. On Saturday, October 20th, Ted climbed into his Porsche and drove to East Hampton for a quiet weekend on Middle Lane. That night, he dined alone at his favorite restaurant, ordering tuna steak and a few glasses of white wine. He went for a walk on the beach and called his girlfriend from his cell phone. Then he returned to the mansion alone. On Monday morning, Ted Ammon didn't show up for work. Not only has Ted failed to show for a meeting, but he hasn't made any arrangements for his children to be picked up from school. Very unusual for him. Everybody started calling me from the office and asking to me if Mr. Ammon called me or not. I called Mr. Amon to the his cell, I think, it four or five times, and he's never answered. Ted's business partner, Mark Angelson, picked up Milt Massius, chartered a helicopter, and flew to East Hampton. Ted's car was in the driveway, and his three dogs were out back, barking loudly. They found the garage door open and the burglar alarm off. They searched downstairs, calling Ted's name. Ted, Ted, Mr. Amo, Mr. Amo. There was no answer. So they moved upstairs, still calling his name. Ted, Ted. He's not moving, he's not answer. Say, Milton, something is wrong, big wrong here. Then, in the master bedroom, they found his body. Downstairs. Ted's money clip was sitting out with $1,800 in it. That obviously tells you that it's not um, a burglary, it's not a robbery. Uh, also, the nature of the crime itself. Um, this was a very, very brutal crime. It was an upfront 30 blows to the head. This was a, a personal motive. It tells you this is somebody who's got a real anger at this individual. Shortly after the murder, Ted Ammon's first wife, Randy Day, contacted me and I met with her in the coffee shop at the Waldorf Astoria. Even though Ted and Randy had divorced almost 20 years before, they'd remained close friends. She was devastated and angry. Ted had told her, that woman won't be satisfied until I'm dead. Two days later, he was dead. Police wanted to question the widow and her boyfriend. Both claimed to have solid alibis for the weekend, but they refused to speak to investigators. Instead, Generosa hired a defense attorney who specialized in murder cases. Why? Maybe it was just a uh, smart, preemptive decision by someone who could anticipate that questions would be asked, or maybe it was something else. As the days after the murder stretched into weeks, the story began to die down. Then, in mid-November, lawyers opened Ted Ammon's will and discovered a bombshell. As it turns out, Ted's will had not been updated since 1995. It was almost certainly going to be updated as a consequence of getting formally divorced. But the divorce papers hadn't been signed yet. The will was untouched. And as for Ted's fortune, Generosa was getting it all. Just like that, Generosa went from a wealthy ex-wife to a filthy rich widow. Most people in her shoes would lay low, but not Generosa. She and her high school dropout boyfriend seemed determined to cause a stir. In the weeks after Ted Ammon was murdered in his East Hampton mansion, his estranged wife, Generosa, and her live-in boyfriend, Danny Pelosi, refused to cooperate with investigators. Most of us, if the police said, we've got to ask you some questions, uh, well, maybe we'd know to have our Miranda rights read to us, but we would feel obligated to say what we knew about the murder of our uh, spouse. Instead, the couple hired a high-powered legal team but it didn't keep them out of the media glare. Any defense attorney worth his salt would have advised Generosa and Danny to stay out of the spotlight. 
but they weren't taking advice from anyone. Instead of towing the line, they walked down the aisle only three months after Ted's death. People were aghast. Staggering. Well, at the least, you would have to say that she had recovered quickly from her grief for her um, former husband. As for Danny, he divorced his old wife just a day before he married the new one. It was certainly shocking. And uh, from, from my perspective, just looking at them, they have all these high-priced lawyers around them. They do probably the one thing that triggered even more suspicion and even more tabloid interest in them. To escape the media glare, Generosa and Danny moved with the children to the Coverwood mansion in England. Pelosi embraced his newfound prosperity with gusto, reportedly blowing through millions of dollars on boats and cars and trips for him and his friends. He could come and go as he pleased. He went to Las Vegas with hundreds of thousands of dollars of Generosa's money, and the only thing she told him to do was bet it all on the single hand of blackjack. But the party didn't last. A month after the wedding, Pelosi was back on Long Island to face felony drunk driving charges. Mindful of the murder investigation, authorities suspended his passport, keeping him in the U.S. indefinitely. With all respect to the press and your diligence, we have no comment at this point. But the media were relentless. Hi. Are you Danny Pelosi? Are you Danny Pelosi? You know I'm Danny Pelosi. Get out of here. And though Danny's lawyers told him to keep quiet, he couldn't stop talking. Did you do anything at all ever to hurt Ted Ammon? Never. Never. Uh, what happened to Mr. Ammon is a sin. And whoever's liable for it has a big penance to pay. Who could have killed Ted Ammon? If I had that answer, I'd give it to you. Because there's more pressure on me than anybody here. Anybody in the whole story, yeah? It all comes down to me. I think Danny Pelosi loved being at the center of attention, even if it was attention over having done, allegedly, something absolutely horrendous. He loved the focus on him. Generosa returned to the U.S. to live with Danny in Center Mauritius. The Hamptons, it wasn't. Soon, the couple was reported to be drinking too much and having screaming matches almost every night. It was sort of like a James M. Cain novel, like the postman always rings twice. It's like then these two people started eating each other alive, whether it was because of the guilt of what had sort of gone on there or, it, you know, his personality and hers. Then, Generosa's life went from bad to worse. In May 2002, she began to suffer fainting spells. A month later, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and began undergoing chemotherapy. In the meantime, Danny pleaded guilty to the outstanding drunk driving charge and was sentenced to a year in prison. He was released in June 2003. I'd like you guys just to respect me today. It's been a long road. Uh, I want to get home to my children, to my wife. But Danny wouldn't be out of the spotlight for long. The Ammon murder investigation was heating up, and investigators had him in their sights. There wasn't a murder weapon. There weren't any witnesses. Danny Pelosi certainly never confessed to the crime, and neither did anybody else. So police had to work around these obstacles and come up with ways in which they could piece together a case that would end up with a conviction, and that takes time. Detectives learned that Generosa and Danny had secretly installed a high-tech surveillance system in the East Hampton mansion so they could spy on Ted. So, of course, that would give you a movie of the crime. You know, you'd have an image of the killer coming up the stairs and entering into the master bedroom. What's better than that? But when investigators went looking for the system, they discovered that its hard drive had been mysteriously removed. The fact that that unit was gone told us that somebody you know a knew it was there b knew how to remove it and c knew that it would have captured their image so that was a pretty big clue meantime generosa's cancer was growing worse realizing her time was short she wrote up a new will danny wasn't part of it instead 
he got a flat payment. A buyout of sorts. He and Generosa decided that he was going to get $2 million, and this was going to be the money that would provide legal defense for him when he was indicted. In July 2003, Generosa left Danny for good, moving with the children back into the mansion on Middle Lane. She died a month later. In her final will, she left everything to the children, and ironically, the Ammon Foundation, a charity Ted had started. She named the children's nanny, Kay Maine, as their guardian. So Danny picks up Jenna Rosa's ashes at Frankie Campbell's, the fancy funeral home in Manhattan, and brings them around the corner to the Stanhope Hotel. He goes to the bar, orders a beer and a Cosmopolitan, Jenna Rosa's favorite drink. Then he gives her a farewell toast. The photographer just happened to be there and snapped a photo. Danny Pelosi was back in the news. In the months after Generosa's death, Danny Pelosi became the primary suspect in the murder of millionaire Ted Ammon. He was the guy who had every motive and every bit of access necessary to commit this kind of a crime. But producing enough evidence to bring charges against the former electrician would prove to be a challenge. A grand jury began hearing evidence in June 2003. It would take investigators nine months to interview the nearly 60 witnesses. We had difficulty getting to the evidence and getting to the witnesses. Every individual we went to speak to refused to speak to us. In the end, it wasn't the witnesses that provided the most damning testimony. It was the suspect himself. Danny never could keep his big mouth shut. And now it would come back to haunt him. He, he's a bit of a braggart, um, and he does do a lot of talking. So he was his own worst enemy. Witnesses admitted to the grand jury, and later, at the trial, that Danny had either admitted to killing Ted Ammon or had talked about it. According to friend James Nicolino, the man who had first told Danny about the townhouse renovation project, Danny first spoke of murdering Ted a year before it happened, when the two went out for drinks. He told Nicolino that he was going to figure out a way to get Generosa's money. And he didn't care what it took. If it meant beating the brains out of Ted Amon, that's what he was willing to do. After the murder, Danny's girlfriend, Tracy Riebenfeld, said Danny boasted about it to her. He told her you know, that he'd gone into the house and that, I think he said, um, I, I bashed his brains in and he cried like a bitch and he begged for his life. The next time Danny is said to have admitted being Ted's killer was after marrying Generosa in 2002. The British nanny, Kay Maine, said that Danny told her that Ted had begged for his life as he beat him to death. He came back drunk and he woke her up and she said he was trying to frighten me and she said he whispered in her ear you know I killed Ted and it was horrible you know there was blood everywhere the confessions were damning but Danny had an alibi for the night of the murder his sister who lived in center Mauritius 40 miles from the mansion she said Danny drove out from New York that night arriving with a friend around 1.30 in the morning. They didn't stay long. He then went up into the attic, got something, and they were going to go out, he told her, to get beer. And then they pulled away. And that was at 2 o'clock in the morning. She didn't see him again until after 8 the next morning. To the DA's office, Danny's alibi seemed full of holes. Their medical examiner had estimated the time of death to be between 1 and 5 a.m. Danny could have easily left his sisters at 2. Made the 45-minute drive to East Hampton. Killed Ted and been back at his sisters before dawn. Danny's sister wasn't just a weak alibi. She also provided incriminating information about Danny's activities on that fateful night. She hugged him goodbye. He was wearing a leather jacket. She said she felt something in the coat pocket, and it felt hard. And she asked him, you know, what's going on here? 
and he told him nothing, you know, not to worry about it, go to bed. More damning information came from Danny's own father. He said the day after Ted's murder, Danny asked him an ominous question. Danny approached him and said, um, you know, if you had something and you wanted to get rid of it, you know, or put it somewhere where no one would ever find it, how would you do it? There was no smoking gun, but Danny's incriminating statements gave the district attorney enough to move forward and file charges. In a case that lacks such fundamental pieces of evidence as a murder weapon, as a confession, as eyewitnesses, when you're lacking all of those things, what you really need are people who are going to give testimony that's damaging, and that's what these people did. They didn't see the crime being committed themselves, but they spoke to Pelosi afterwards, and he told them directly that he was the one that did it. On March 23, 2004, nearly two and a half years after Ted Ammon's death, Daniel Pelosi was indicted for second-degree murder. Facing 25 years to life, Danny put his fate into the hands of criminal defense attorney Gerald Shargell. Our case can defeat their case, period. Jerry Shargell had been in the headlines before. Back in 1990, when the government went after mobster John Gotti, the Teflon Don, Shargell gave him his non-stick reputation. His counsel doesn't come cheap, but Danny had two million dollars to spend thanks to Generosa. The DA's office was up against some big guns and a huge war chest. But the prosecution came out swinging, announcing a stunning development on the day the trial was to begin. We have two additional witnesses that we expect to testify and that those witnesses had direct admissions from the defendant uh, in this murder. Uh, Are they fellow inmates? From the, defendant. the prosecution announced it had 40 hours of secret jailhouse recordings between Danny and another inmate, Clayton Moultrie. Danny allegedly asked Moultrie to beat up a witness and intimidate jurors. He was offering him $500 per tooth and certain things for a broken jaw. In hopes of reducing his own sentence, Moultrie went to the authorities. They sent him back with a wire and got Danny to confess to the murder, all on tape. The defendant told him that he was trying to break every bone in the body uh, and that he'd hit him with a baseball bat. Moultrie also said Pelosi threatened the prosecutor's children after reading about them in the newspaper. He showed that to Mr. Moultrie, had highlighted that portion about my two kids and made statements to him indicating that you know, he wanted to see certain things done to them. But the biggest bombshell in the story was yet to come. At trial, an X-rated witness would stun even Ted Ammon's closest friends. The steamy saga was about to reach its boiling point. On October 13th, 2004, nearly three years to the day after Ted Ammon was killed in his East Hampton estate, the trial of Danny Pelosi finally began. During opening statements, the prosecution said Danny killed Ted because he thought Generosa's $25 million divorce settlement wasn't enough. Danny wanted the entire fortune. Probably the motive was just greed. Um, he was in this for the money all along. Um, he was in it for the money right up until the end. He wanted money, 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 money. By the prosecution's own admission, the case was largely circumstantial. No murder weapon, no eyewitness no DNA well it certainly wasn't a slam dunk you know I was certainly concerned uh, about the quality of the evidence that we had and its ability to convince you know 12 ordinary citizens beyond a reasonable doubt but they had a string of witnesses who said Danny confessed the defense tried to discredit them all the prisoner was sort of a get out of jail free card for the girlfriend it was uh, a scorned lover for Nicolini, it was, well, Danny car was carrying on with the guy's wife. But there was also some hard evidence. The medical examiner had found marks on Ted's body that appeared to be made by a stun gun. The prosecution believed Danny used it to incapacitate Ted, who was larger and stronger than him. Danny owned at least one stun gun and was known to use them on friends for fun. He was stunning people at the job site, and... So I said to him, well, did you enjoy that? 
And he actually said, yeah, I did. After six weeks of testimony from 41 witnesses, it was the defense's turn. According to the defense, Ted led a secret gay life and could have been killed by one of the men he met for anonymous sex. They had a witness, Sam Wagner, a regular house guest of one of the Ammons' neighbors. Wagner claimed that he'd run into Ted out jogging one morning in May of 1999. This guy Wagner said that he asked the stranger, do you want to get busy? Then he testified that he took the man into the bushes and gave him oral sex. They didn't even know each other's names. He wasn't introduced to me before. I had no idea who this man was that I was with. But when I saw his photograph in the newspaper, I knew it was him. For many court observers, the trial had hit a new low. It was plenty juicy before that time. I think it became juicy slash trashy when you had, you know, you know, uh, an escapade of this kind spilled out into the courtroom in front of everybody. Suddenly, the defense theory that a secret gay lover had attacked Ted didn't seem so far-fetched. After all, Ted was naked when the police found his body and the bed sheets were missing. Why would somebody take the bed clothes? Maybe there's some trace of semen. Then there was the last call Ted ever made to his girlfriend at 9.44 p.m. the night he was killed. He left a message saying he was at a gay beach. He had become frightened and was going home. Then the question is, how could Ted Ammon not know it was a gay beach? This was a notorious gay beach in the Hamptons. Was he walking the dogs, or was he in search of a tryst? It all made perfect sense to the defense. They said that Ted Ammon was conflicted sexually, and they used that phone message as a piece of evidence in the picture that they were painting of a man who would, from time to time, have homosexual encounters. And what they suggested to the jury was that on the night that he died, he brought a man home from the beach, and that man eventually killed him. After only five days, Danny Pelosi's defense team was preparing to rest. That's when the trial, already full of startling twists, took yet another unexpected turn. Danny Pelosi was going to testify. I looked at the defense lawyer and I said, you've got to be kidding me. And he said, nope. And I looked back at the defendant, you know, with that look of, <laughs> you got to be kidding. And he was all proud of himself, you know, shaking his head up and down, mouthing to me, yep, I'm getting up there. The hard-charging DA versus the hot-headed defendant. Could Danny Pelosi keep his cool, or would he snap? And finally, show the jury his true colors. Danny Pelosi had swaggered through his entire trial, winking at jurors, joking with family members, chatting freely with the press. Now, he was about to go one-on-one -on -one with the prosecutor. And this is one of these guys that you think, oh, please let him take the stand. At least let me have some fun. Here was this confrontation that everybody had been waiting for, the diminutive prosecutor, this real pit bull of a woman facing off against Pelosi, who made no secrets about hating her. Everybody was dying to see what was going to happen. It was a five-hour showdown. Under a withering cross-examination, Danny claimed he never wanted Ted Ammon's money and never killed the millionaire. As for the witnesses who said he confessed to the murder, Danny said they were all mistaken. Danny seemed to be turning in an Academy Award performance. The tough-talking thug transformed into a cool, calm guy next door. But the jury saw through his charade. He himself got a little bit hot under the collar. You could see that he was trying to hold it back. He was trying, really, really trying to hold his inner feelings back. But it did come through to us. Under a final redirect, Danny said Generosa had once asked him to kill Ted, but that he declined. Telling the jury that she asked me to kill her husband, I thought was damning for him, not helpful. I don't think that there's a, you know, a 1-800 hotline for Upper East Side uh, overindulged women who want to kill their husbands. You know, they don't have that kind of hotline. So where would she go to find somebody to do this? She didn't have to go far. He was sleeping in the bed next to her. The next day, during closing arguments, Danny's lawyer suggested it was Generosa who murdered Ted Ammon, 
a theory he recapped for the press outside. Generoso was a person filled with rage and hatred. Danny Pelosi testified uh, the day before yesterday that she asked him uh, to, to uh, uh, murder Ted Ammon, and he refused. So I think that uh, Generoso Ammon is, uh, is uh, actually someone to consider. The tactic didn't fly with the jury. The gay love, it didn't work, so now let's go after the dead lady. It did seem to me that they were grasping at straws at the end. The jury deliberated through the weekend. By Monday morning, the verdict was in. Most days, there had always been buzzing and people talking. At that moment, it was just silent, and there was just a palpable tension and nervousness in the air. When we went into the courtroom and had a read that we found him guilty, I don't think there was one, any of us who was not shaking, absolutely shaking. When he heard the guilty verdict, Danny Pelosi, the man who had always seemed to have something to say, was for the first time silent. He was crying, he had his head in his hands, he just had the look of complete and utter defeat. In the end, it was the preponderance of evidence that brought Danny down. There was really not one piece of evidence by itself. It was all of the evidence. What Janet Albertson did was paint the picture for us, but Danny signed his name to it. A month and a half after the verdict, Danny Pelosi was sentenced to the maximum, 25 years to life in prison. I've convicted the right man, and I'm ready for him to go away into a cell where no one has to hear him talk anymore. He has gotten more than his fair share of attention, and now it's time to just slam the door shut and leave him to rot where he belongs. We'll never really know what role Jenna Rosa played in her husband's murder. Was she merely a pawn in Danny's plan, or had she pulled all the strings? It's a secret she took to her grave. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.